Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here and uh, on a glorious morning. It's a, absolutely fabulous. Uh, of course, we deserve it for the weather, winter we had, you know, it was a tough winter. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, to the Military Strategy Forum, and my special thanks to our friends at Rolls-Royce who make it possible for us to make this series available to the policy community in Washington. And we're very delighted to have Mike Vickers with us this morning. Um, I was serving up in the Armed Services Committee when, uh, I think, gosh, I can't remember the years, I think it was 1990, no, 1988 when we created the Program 11 and the whole Special Operations Command, SOCOM, et cetera. And I think that we actually had Mike in mind for who would be the leader at uh, SOCOM. It took a while for us to find him. You know, and uh, at the time, Mike was, of course, serving uh, in, the, in the CIA, had a long history in special forces, and came to the administration to become the, the SOLIC commander, or I mean, the SOLIC uh, assistant secretary back in 2007. And we were, it was just the right time when, when he was brought in. The Bush administration asked him to come in to give some direction, and it was, uh, did a masterful job. And of course, then Bob Gates felt that no one would be better to replace Jim Clapper than Mike to be the Undersecretary for Intelligence. I think it's been uh, masterful service, Mike. We've been lucky as a country to have you at this crucial time. I know it's been a, a challenging and wearing uh, assignment, uh, but you shouldered it so wonderfully, and the, the whole community is grateful for what you've done. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting session this morning, uh, and Kath is going to be leading the question and answer period. I expect this is going to be a very vivid and lively session. So would you, with your applause, please welcome Mike Vickers, Undersecretary for Intelligence. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hamry, for that really gracious introduction, and, and, and thank you and to D Dr. Hicks for your distinguished service uh, to our country and uh, to CSIS for putting on important uh, forums such as this. Uh, I thought I'd make a, um, a few remarks um, uh, this morning for about 20 minutes and then take questions as the standard uh, uh, format. Uh, next slide, please. Which one hits it? Uh, so is that the center button? Oh, okay, good. All right. Which one? Left one? All right, good. I'm I'm qualified now on this thing. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about these. Um, four topics, and given that this is a um, military strategy forum, I'm going to try to uh, move beyond my intelligence brief a little bit and talk about some of the implications for strategy, for national security strategy, defense strategy, and intelligence strategy as we, uh, as, as we uh, look at these issues. Um, before I do, uh, one of the themes I'd like to leave you with is the tremendous change that's taken place uh, in our intelligence capabilities uh, over the past decade, and the even greater change that we foresee uh, looking forward. One of the aspects of this is um, the revolutionary impact precision targeting has had across our intelligence enterprise, whether it's in counterterrorism operations, whether it's in cyber operations, or classic uh, human intelligence and espionage. And to illustrate this, I'd like to, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to tell a joke that my uh, former boss, Secretary Bob Gates, used to love to tell about the old way we did business. Um, many, many years ago, supposedly, an intelligence officer was working uh, at a, uh, in a foreign capital uh, uh, at a diplomatic cocktail party, you know, trolling the, the diplomatic circuit, as we often do, uh, looking for hard targets. And unfortunately, this officer had a little bit too much to drink, and so his mission attention wandered a little bit toward more amorous pursuits rather than uh, traditional hard targets. 
And across the room at this big reception, he spotted what he saw was a vision of loveliness in a flowing red gown. So using all his appropriate tradecraft, he approached the target and made a pitch asking the target uh, uh, if uh, he could have a dance. And then he, to his shock, the target immediately rebuffed him and said, I'm rebuffing you for three reasons. First, you are drunk. Second, this is not a waltz, it's the Peruvian national anthem. And third, I am not a woman, I am the Cardinal Archbishop of Lima. <laughs> so we're a little better than that uh, today. We, uh, we enable our case officers with more precision targeting and our, and our other operators as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to go through a range of uh, national security challenges, the continued terrorism threat by, posed by Al-Qaeda and its affiliates being the first one. The key point I want to leave you with here is while we've had a lot of success in uh, severely degrading Al-Qaeda core in the Pakistan-Afghanistan um, border region, uh, they continue to pose a threat, and particularly a reconstitution uh, threat uh, down the road. But the three biggest threats are really Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, centered in Yemen, and the growing Al-Qaeda threat in Syria. And Al-Qaeda's affiliates, of course, are spread elsewhere, and they're taking advantage of what we, what we call uh, the metastasization, you know, using a cancer analogy, across the Middle East and uh, in, in North Africa. Uh, uh, and that is the conditions that are created by uh, of our ungoverned spaces and the historic transformation um, that's underway uh, in that region. There's also, of course, the threat of uh, homegrown violent extremists, as we saw with the Boston bomber and, and others as well. And so this really remains job one uh, for the intelligence community uh, and, uh, and our special operations forces as well. The Syrian civil war uh, prevent, uh, presents a uh, particularly vexing national security challenge. It's a horrific civil war um, with 150,000 dead. It's a humanitarian uh, crisis of uh, uh, mind-boggling proportions with some 9 million uh, internally displaced or uh, refugees who have fled the country about two-thirds and, and one-third, uh, and a continuing uh, humanitarian crisis. And of course, it's giving rise to uh, a significant terrorism threat um, there as well. As the president noted in his speech at West Point, um, we are committed to supporting um, the Syrian opposition to help them in their stand against the brutal dictator Bashar al-Assad, uh, and to help them determine uh, a, uh, help, these, help them fight for the right of all Syrian people to determine their own future, and then finally uh, uh, to deny uh, terrorists the um, a sanctuary or safe haven that they're currently enjoying in, in Syria. And we will work with the Congress uh, uh, to um, ramp up our support for the opposition. Now we come to Russian uh, revanchism. I get teased about uh, uh, using the word revanchism, but um, it has many aspects, but probably the most concerning uh, currently is the destabilization going on in eastern Ukraine and what we in the special operations community would term unconventional warfare. Well, Russian forces have pulled back their troops from the border region. Um, uh, they have not uh, uh, ceased their um, support for um, uh, pro-Russian separatists in, uh, in eastern Ukraine, uh, and that threat remains uh, uh, to the government of Ukraine and its territorial integrity. Cyber threats. Um, these threats span the range from intellectual property theft uh, to disruptive denial of service attacks, to uh, destructive attacks uh, through malware. Uh, so emerging uh, domain that has moved very rapidly. Uh, over the past couple years, we've had destructive attacks against um, South Korea, against uh, Saudi Arabia, and denial of service attacks against the uh, U.S. financial sector, as Director Clapper made clear in his uh, unclassified annual threat assessment. The likelihood of future destructive attacks is increasing. 
And that, oh, let's see. All right. There we go. My first test. Okay. Uh, proliferation and use of WMD, the next, uh, the next issue for us. Um, we continue to have concerns about the Iranian and North Korean nuclear and missile programs. Uh, Iran has made considerable progress in its ability uh, to enrich and stockpile uh, uh, uranium and has continued to work on its missile programs. Uh, North Korea, uh, as Director Clapper indicated in his uh, uh, annual threat assessment, uh, is, uh, we assess is expanding its use, uh, its uh, facility uh, for uh, uranium enrichment and has restarted uh, its graphite moderated uh, reactor and continues to develop uh, long range missile programs, most notably the uh, intercontinental KN08 that it has displayed publicly a, a few times. The, um, I already alluded to this earlier about the persistent volatility across Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia that will likely be with us for a long time to come and will give rise to a range of uh, national security challenges. This is really one of the key enduring challenges I think we um, um, face along with a couple of others uh, on this slide, uh, or on the pre this slide and the previous one. Um, um, all right, a transition in Afghanistan. The president announced right before uh, his speech at West Point uh, that we will maintain uh, 9,800 troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and by the end of 2000, calendar 2015, we will reduce that posture approximately in half and consolidate uh, uh, the force on Kabul and Bagram. And then no later than the end of 2016, we will reduce it further to a normal uh, embassy-based presence uh, centered on uh, Kabul. Uh, Afghan forces assumed the lead uh, for combat operations last year, and at the end of this year, uh, combat operations uh, in Afghanistan uh, will cease. We will continue to train, advise, and assist uh, Afghan forces and to, and to pursue our uh, continued counterterrorism mission uh, in, in the region. And the rise of China. Um, this of uh, China of late uh, has engaged in uh, uh, provocative behavior in, in maritime disputes across the uh, East Asian littoral. Uh, is continuing its military uh, modernization and has um, uh, attempted to counter uh, U.S. engagement in, in Asia um, by asserting that the United States is a declining power, uh, which we are most certainly not, and we will remain a Pacific power. The key thing I would like you to take away from the previous two slides is that when you look at these in total, uh, a number of us senior intelligence officers, Director Clapper, uh, my good friend, former CIA director, Deputy Director Michael Morell, and Acting Director, uh, haven't seen this range of challenges on an, administra in a, on an administration's plate uh, in our careers. You know, we may be wrong about that, but that, that's our collective uh, judgment. Second point is that um, Taken together, these are highly asymmetric challenges. Uh, these are not directly head-on-head. Head. Uh, some of them are even further and unconventional or novel, as in the cyber case, or in, uh, indirect in terms of challenges happening across the region or the relationship between economic power and, and national security power. The other point that I want to highlight is that unlike the Cold War, where we had one really enduring and, and not to be uh, discounted national security challenge, and then a series of crises, um, a number of these are likely to be more persistent and enduring. And so again, that really creates some challenges for strategy as you deal with uh, endure, enduring, very um, difficult to solve uh, multiple problem sets. Some of you may remember in the late 1970s, in the Department of Defense, we developed uh, in response to the situation in Central Europe an offset strategy to counter Soviet military power, and then followed that up through the 1980s um, with a series of other uh, strategies to reinforce that and bring an end to the Cold War. Um, as I look at it today, 
we, we need a, we not just one offset strategy, but a series of them to deal with these specific challenges. Um, and then the final point I want to make is that uh, also critical to de dealing with these set of enduring challenges is the continued economic and technological leadership of the United States, which, as former Secretary Gates and others have said, you know, is a national, and, and is a national security imperative for us. Okay, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the relationship between intelligence and national security. Uh, we always say it's the first line of defense. Uh, this time going forward, we really, really do mean it. Um, the uh, benefits that it gives us is it informs our national security policy. Again, if you're the president and his top advisors and you're trying to make sense of this wide array of challenges, uh, intelligence is the first thing you need to have to understand the, the world in which you're dealing with. And then for our operators, our warfighters and other operators, uh, our intelligence capabilities really enable uh, what we call intelligence-driven uh, precision operations. When directed by the president, the intelligence community provides him with additional uh, options in between diplomacy and the, and the uh, overt use of military force. These are very important as well. And then, of course, our, our uh, principal raison d'etre is preventing strategic surprise. It's very challenging uh, today as we look forward. I would add one other point as we look at this, uh, and that is intelligence is a significant source of advantage for the United States today. Um, and it's an advantage that is very important to us, but it's also one that has to be used uh, aggressively, but also prudently uh, to make sure we're helping our uh, leaders solve problems and not uh, adding, adding to their problems. And of course, as you conduct operations, um, there's inherent risk in them, and so the risk gain uh, is something that we look at all the time and continue to evolve. All right, now I'd like to talk about some uh, investments we're making uh, in capability areas to sustain this intelligence advantage well into the future. I've grouped this into five areas um, uh, to um, focus defense intelligence and our integration with national intelligence uh, uh, on the uh, defense strategic guidance that Dr. Hicks uh, worked on so ably uh, a couple years ago, I guess it was, uh, and the president signed out, and then our quadrennial defense review, which we just completed and soon to be released, uh, national intelligence strategy. I group our major priorities into five areas. Uh, global coverage, the ability to operate in what we call anti-access area uh, denial environments, a key power projection uh, challenge for us. Um, sustaining our capabilities in counterterrorism operations and, and adding to them in, in uh, counterproliferation. Uh, building out our cyber capabilities and then strengthening our, ability, our capabilities in counterintelligence and security. So let me touch on a few of these. Um, first, global coverage. This really enables uh, everything we do across mission areas, uh, and as the um, budgets flatten or decline, becomes even more important given the uh, global uh, distribution and diversity of challenges that we face. I can't say too much about the specifics in, in many of these areas, but I will say a few things. Um, the first, as Director Clapper said in Colorado Springs a couple weeks ago, and uh, Betty Sapp, our director of the NRO, mentioned at a conference in Florida about a month ago, um, there are big changes ahead uh, in the way we use our uh, overhead uh, space architecture. Some of the biggest changes, in my view, that we've seen in, um, in um, several decades. Uh, it will be possible, as Director Clapper mentioned, through uh, techniques uh, um, such as activity-based uh, intelligence and associated um, um, architecture capabilities to go with it to have persistence we've never had before, to where we can look at things for long periods of time. And you can imagine the, the benefits that will give us. The second aspect uh, that I, will, I believe will be revolutionary as we go forward besides um, persistence is uh, integration. Uh, rather than having an overhead architecture, as Betty Sapp described it, that, that uh, 
uh, is a set of individual systems with uh, supporting systems, we will have for the first time uh, going forward a really integrated architecture that can tip and queue, and there's tremendous benefits that come from that. We're working to strengthen our um, uh, cryptanalytic uh, capabilities and then our uh, national uh, level defense human capabilities uh, through an initiative uh, we uh, call the Defense Clandestine Service. In the anti-access aerial denial environment, this is uh, really associated with our uh, uh, rebalance to Asia and to keep pace with um, uh, high-end challenges. Uh, we're working on uh, assured, persistent intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance uh, and the resiliency of our, uh, of our space architecture. And that's about all I can say it at that point. But the third bullet is really kind of indicative there. And that is, um, we're focused as a strategy on adapting some of the uh, techniques we've learned in counterterrorism, where we have gotten incredibly precise, and apply that to these uh, higher-end environments. In the counterterrorism area, um, the Predator and Reaper, the unmanned aerial aircraft, uh, unaffectionately known as drones, uh, uh, have been the signature weapon of our counterterrorism uh, capability over the past decade, much as the improvised explosive device has been the signature weapon of insurgents and terrorists. Uh, it has enabled uh, the most precise campaign, counterterrorism campaign, uh, in the history of warfare, uh, and it is our most effective uh, instrument. Uh, uh, we are very healthy in this area, but we are looking to make enhancements in some advanced sensors, uh, as well as uh, extending the range of our second generation platform uh, considerably. Uh, our, our integration between our operators and uh, intelligence is another key advantage uh, in both of these areas and something uh, we're working to sustain as well. And then back to the challenges chart. As the CT problem um, uh, evolves and shifts on us, we're at a turning point, not just in national security strategy, um, but also in the counterterrorism arena of the need to rebalance and rethink um, some of the ways uh, we've done business. What has really worked? What is adaptable uh, to the evolving threat? Um, what is not? And what do we need to in, uh, invent uh, anew? Okay, on cyber capabilities, uh, we're making significant progress in developing a cyber force uh, uh, to defend our networks, uh, to support combatant commanders, and to defend the United States uh, uh, if called upon to do so, and the associated support um, uh, structures to go with it, uh, intelligence capabilities as you would in any new domain, whether it's space or cyber or others. Um, Key to making that cyber force effectively, and we've had a number of great sessions, including some here at CSIS, is really our partnerships with industry, our partnerships across the U.S. government with the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, uh, but also with industry uh, in terms of, particularly in the area of uh, information sharing. And then finally, counterintelligence and security. As a result of WikiLeaks, Snowden, uh, Fort Hood and the Navy Yard uh, review, or uh, Navy Yard attack, excuse me, and the reviews associated with those four uh, incidents, uh, we've taken significant measures now to strengthen our capabilities against insider threats, whether it's workplace violence or uh, uh, espionage, and are establishing an insider threat center uh, going forward. We're also working with the Congress and with the OPM uh, looking to, and the DNI looking to shift our, the way we uh, evaluate people for positions of responsibility and security clearances through a method called continuous evaluation. If you think of rather than snapshots in times where you do an investigation and then you wait several years and you do it again, this is more a continuous stream like you do with credit checks. Uh, and we believe it will have a number of advantages. Okay, let me conclude by talking about the importance of intelligence integration. This was the focus of the 9-11 Commission, uh, and there are four areas uh, I'd like to talk about. Um, some of this 
honestly predated 9-11 and it has been uh, at work, uh, uh, it's been the process of a couple decades of work. And then of course others have really accelerated um, since then in responding to evolving threats. The first one is integration within agencies. The CIA I knew in the 1980s is not the CIA of today. It is vastly more integrated uh, in terms of its major components and, and directorates, and it produces big dividends uh, by doing so. Our intelligence agencies work much closer together. It's hard to find a case where a single intelligence agency has been responsible for a, uh, a significant intelligence breakthrough or operation. The bin Laden case uh, is a particular example of that, where CIA, NSA, and NGA uh, worked in extremely close partnership to produce the intelligence case um, that we need, and that, that really is the model uh, going forward. Director Clapper and I have made it a uh, top priority to make sure that our national and defense intelligence programs are integrated and transparent to each other. We make a number of joint investments together. Um, we depend on each other's capabilities to do our missions. Uh, things that you would think of as tactical capabilities perform some critically important national missions, and our tactical operations in the department depend critically on national capabilities. Uh, and then finally, the partnership between the Department of Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency is uh, very important across the board uh, in a number of intelligence areas uh, and, in, uh, in, and in capabilities. And so with that, I'd like to conclude, and I'd be happy to take your questions with Dr. Hicks. Thank you very much, Secretary Vickers, for your, your great remarks, and good morning to everyone. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I run the International Security Program here at CSIS. Um, and you covered truly uh, the, the waterfront, and uh, I think it gives us a very rich uh, conversation opportunity here with the audience, and I'll turn it over to them for questions in a few minutes, but there are a few things um, I thought I'd start with. This last issue that you raised, there's two issues on your last slide you raised, one generally on integration, um, and specifically ending on the DOD CIA piece. Let me take the first part of that. We really have come in the time that you've been in your positions within the Department of Defense from 2007 to now, from the world of trying to transition from need to know to need to share to, to a, I hope, a culture of need to share. That was the intent. But now, of course, we've had a series of incidents that test that. Snowden being the, the most recent. I'm wondering if you can um, give a sense of where you think the community is and where the community needs to be on this issue of how much to share, how to control information, have we swung too far, um, or um, in fact, do we just uh, need to accept that there are risks that come with a need to share culture? Uh, thanks. Well, the We continue to have a strong need to share intelligence. Uh, our national security strategy depends on enabling partners. Um, that requires uh, intelligence sharing. Um, and to make the national security apparatus effective across the interagency, uh, both domestic and foreign, also requires a high degree of intelligence sharing while also protecting uh, need to know. So in that vein, um, we are modernizing our information technologies to try, to, our information systems, technology systems, excuse me, across both the IC and within the Department of Defense uh, to try to strike a reasonable balance there between the need to protect information and also distribute it. In the uh, IC, it's called iSight, uh, which is a uh, uh, ICITE, which is intelligence community, uh, intelligence technology, uh, information technology enterprise. And in the department, we're moving toward a system called the Joint Information Environment. Uh, both of those are cloud-based and uh, will give us um, some security advantages along with, with other technologies. Um, so in a way, it's really the right balance to be struck, but there, um, you know, some things like 
bin Laden had to be compartmented intensely, uh, as, as you know. Um, uh, others less so, but uh, um, y we, we can't really move back from the, uh, the information sharing environment. We just have to do it more responsibly. And then you're, you're, you ended on the DOD-CIA nexus, and that's an area where you in, in have been particularly effective at bringing the two agencies together. The president in his West Point speech last week reiterated his call to transition more operations, uh, more emphasis from CIA to DOD on the counterterrorism direct action piece. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how that transition is going. He, he had talked about that previously and what the challenges are facing the Department of Defense as it takes on these missions, these direct action missions in, that in some cases have been done by the CIA. Uh, well, I don't want to uh, go into much detail here. Let me make a couple points. Uh, one, our assistant to the president for uh, Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, Lisa Monaco, will be uh, making a speech in the very near future uh, as a uh, update on what has uh, uh, progress since the president's speech at the National Defense University last May. And so I don't want to steal her thunder, and so I'll uh, leave that to her. Um, but also, suffice it to say, uh, uh, we have been working um, since last May and actually before um, to uh, implement the president's guidance. DOD does precision counterterrorism operations. Um, and uh, make sure we have an integrated uh, uh, counterterrorism capability across our IC and uh, the department to uh, meet the president's uh, uh, needs. Very good, and let me stick with ISR moving beyond, not, not necessarily just unmanned, but just ISR in general. I think you made a compelling case for why intelligence is so important in an environment that's as diffuse in its threats, as unpredictable probably in its threats, and we can we can talk about Ukraine and others. Um, but there, and but the pressure on ISR in that kind of environment is incredibly intense. And you alluded to the flat budget. The budget environment is not conducive to a great deal of increased investment in in many areas. How well do you think ISR? fares in that budget environment, and are there areas of particular concern that you have in terms of how we make sure the entire intelligence enterprise is well resourced? Sure. So um, as Secretary Hagel made clear in the Quadrennial Defense Review, areas of uh, key focus for him uh, is intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, um, cyber and special operations forces, and so we have the priority uh, we believe it requires. Um, that said, as you know, um, um, we have to be very focused in our investments and what we prioritize. Um, and so in ISR or in other uh, capability areas, um, uh, undersea warfare, long-range strike bomber, et cetera, we're focusing on a critical set of investments uh, that are very important um, to our Asia rebalance, uh, and those have been uh, protected in the department, uh, as well as the continuing capabilities um, we'll need uh, for the counterterrorism problem and the uh, instability across the, uh, the greater Middle East, uh, and then the uh, cyber challenges. And so that's why I've grouped the capability areas uh, that we have. One of the challenges that we face um, in ISR, but really across the department, I would say, is that now more than ever, you have to have an intelligence portfolio approach to investment. And so, you know, you may recall uh, with the different national security challenges we faced in the 1990s, one could think about a, a joint force that had capabilities that could stretch either right or left as necessary. We've long since, and thanks to your leadership, uh, we've long since abandoned that notion in the department. And so we carefully adopt across the spectrum of challenges we've had a series of target investments in each area, more of an outside-in approach, uh, high-end and low-end, and then see what meets in the middle. And that seems to be the best way to beat our national security challenges right now. But with flat and declining budgets, it's, it remains a challenge. 
Well, let me press you just slightly harder on that. Are there areas on the intelligence side that are particularly worrisome to you? I'll give you a complete hypothetical, but maybe this is one. You know, growing the required um, human in the right, you know, language skill sets with the right um, focus, given, again, the diffusion of the threat. Are there areas that you can point to that um, are th something we should be thinking about as a country as we move into th further into the 21st century on the intelligence side? Um, sure. So for some of these investments, um, they depend on either technological advances or making sure significant resources are provided uh, for um, some of our global coverage and anti-access aerial denial uh, capabilities. For others, such as uh, strengthening our human capabilities, it is really more about human capital. It's not a big budget issue as it is a professionalization, language training, posture, uh, integration, a num number of things that take time to transform a force, but uh, um, uh, you know, it's more in the, uh, the, the, the softer side of business, but no less hard because you're changing institutions uh, from one uh, to another. And then in cyber, uh, you know, very, very evolving field and developing the capabilities, but they depend on other capabilities as well, but then also they, de they depend on public-private partnerships. And so without, in each case, there's a critical dependency uh, that's different, however, in these capability areas, and so those are the challenges I try to wrestle to ground with uh, Director Clapper. Okay, let me just ask a, 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 one more question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. I know we have a lot of folks here um, who are, are ready to, to test, your, test your knowledge base across the, the breadth of what the department is doing, what the intelligence community is doing. Let me ask you a really obvious question about Ukraine, which is, um, you know, how well prepared do you think the intelligence community was to see uh, Russian intent in terms of the annexation of Crimea in particular? And um, are, you know, are we now refocusing energy on Russia as a result of that action and subsequent activity by Russia? Um, so I guess I would answer that, that um, uh, you know, Russia is a complex intelligence challenge and it's something uh, that we have been working uh, since the end of the Cold War uh, in, in the intervening decades. Um, but it has been triggered really by, uh, there's been spikes because of buildups to crises or actual crises. So for example, the uh, invasion of Georgia in 2008 uh, and, then, um, uh, and then most recently Ukraine. The uh, invasion of Crimea uh, was done very suddenly, and so as Director Clapper and others have said, uh, the intelligence community did a pretty good job of providing uh, overall uh, warning uh, to the magnitude of the problem, but there's things we can always do better uh, in certain areas, and then, you know, we're very good at once confronted with a crisis in, term, in responding to it and getting better and better. And so uh, uh, we've continued to improve as the uh, uh, crisis has shifted um, uh, to, you know, what I described as unconventional warfare uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and then, you know, the next part of the challenge, which you alluded to in your resource uh, question, is really the longer term challenge posed by this significant change in Russian behavior uh, and how we adapt the, uh, the community to it. So uh, we're, you know, it's a work in progress, but, uh, but it's definitely on leaders' radar screens. Okay, I've left large swaths of the world uncovered, so I'm sure we'll have some questions on those. And I see one all the way over here. And please, uh, when you ask your question, state your name and your affiliation. Hi, uh, thank you for being here today. My name is Christine Vargas. I'm from Avicent, but I also just returned from Egypt as a monitor for uh, Democracy International. And my question, having just been on the ground there, is from a DIA defense standpoint, how are you evolving policies for intelligence sharing with key international partners, especially those with uh, challenging transitions on their hands? Um, well, our... Uh 
our intelligence sharing is, is uh, usually done almost always on a bilateral basis. And it is tailored to the specific requirements of, of, of that partner. And we do it, um, uh, our individual agencies, depending on the case, may have relationships with counterparts in a given country. Um, but we do this on an integrated uh, fashion uh, uh, approach, what we call the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence Representative. So we uh, funnel both our military intelligence as well as um, various forms um, uh, by uh, our, our national agencies um, through this one conduit uh, to a national uh, or to a um, international partner. Uh, and that applies in Egypt's case as well as others. Okay, we have one right here. Uh, thank you, Abad Kutelia, McCain Institute. Uh, I'm from Georgia. Uh, you mentioned uh, as one of the challenges Russian revanchism, and uh, I kind of like this word because it largely describes the mood in Russia. But uh, revanchism is much uh, wider uh, uh, than geographically linked to the Ukraine. So my question is, uh, what is the scale, your, uh, your assessment, what is the scale of the uh, geographic uh, scale of the Russian revanchism and where are the uh, areas you anticipate next crisis linked to the Russian revanchism? Thank you. Um, well, that's why I had um, that broader challenge of um, uh, revanchism rather than specifically the Russia-Ukraine crisis on that slide. Um, and I think there are a number of challenges. There is, you know, as we saw uh, in Georgia in 2008 and uh, Ukraine most recently on the border and in Crimea, um, there's a uh, power projection challenge in uh, what Russia calls its near abroad and uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, um, but then there is also a, a uh, panoply of other influence means and unconventional threats that range from energy coercion to um, cyber to unconventional warfare, as we see. And uh, and those threats may be um, uh, the, the, the greater longer term challenge in a sense because they are highly asymmetric uh, uh, and um, you know, they're not traditional military power. Um, and so our, our strategy with our allies and partners needs to take account of those as well, but that's how I see the longer term challenge. I have one uh, right there. Yes, the gentleman right here. Thank you. Matteo Faini, Princeton University. I'm a little puzzled by the administration's attempt to essentially set a new rule in terms of espionage, saying that espionage uh, conducted on other, that state led espionage on corporate entities done to advantage other uh, corporate entities of one's own country is essentially unfair. I, I find this puzzling for a number of reasons. Few other countries recognize this rule. It would be extremely hard to enforce, not last because if you know that a country is conducting espionage against you, you have no interest in revealing that you know that kind of thing. So I was wondering, could you tell us what, well, first of all, could you allay some of these concerns, tell us what, what the rationale is behind this attempt by the administration to set new rules? and whether or not you think it has a reasonable chance of being successful. Thank you. Um, so I wouldn't characterize, you know, the president was very clear in presidential policy directive 28 on our uh, signals intelligence uh, architecture uh, that the United States does not and will not uh, engage in uh, economic espionage and to, to, uh, and to benefit uh, American companies and international competition. Uh, as you noted, uh, that practice is not universally followed um, by some other countries in the world. Um, I would defer to my economic colleagues on this, but you know, we think a, uh, uh, a global system that will produce economic prosperity 
uh, for all is, um, is um, uh, you know, would be most conducive to having uh, open uh, international competition without um, states stealing private secrets and handing them uh, off to um, uh, their own national companies. If you follow that logic, then companies bear uh, additional costs that they would have to do to protect their systems that I think are not economically productive. I'm drawing on some of my economics training in grad school, but uh, I don't think that's the kind of international system we or international countries uh, should favor, and I think that's true across the board. So I, one, I don't think it's necessarily new, but it is definitive. Um, uh, on our policy uh, on that. Uh, Eric Schmidt with the New York Times. Uh, Secretary Vickers, thank you. Uh, a two-part question on Syria. If you could explain to us a little bit more about the options the Pentagon the administration is considering for DOD to assist arming the Syrian rebels and what operational and other challenges that poses. The second part of the question is, at least for insurgents along that border between Syria and Iraq, it seems to be disappearing. Can you assess for us the ISIS threat in Western Anbar right now and assess how Iraq has been able to deal with that threat given the support the U.S. has provided to them so far? Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so first, um, uh, on um, expanded assistance to the Syrian opposition, uh, I don't want to go further than the, uh, than the president did in his uh, West Point speech. Uh, we are developing options across the administration and uh, consulting uh, with Congress uh, on this, and I'll, uh, that's about as far as I can go uh, right now. Um, on the threat um, um, posed by uh, ISIS, as you called it, or as we call it, uh, ISIL, uh, um, uh, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Um, it is a challenge um, uh, both in Syria and in Western Iraq, which is why we look at this as increasingly as a regional problem. Uh, this is the remnants of uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, uh, that uh, uh, most of them, uh, most of the leadership went to Syria. Uh, after being um, significantly uh, degraded uh, in Iraq. Um, and they have ambitions um, uh, to pose threats uh, broader in the region and, uh, and outside the region. Um, and so it is a very uh, malevolent uh, terrorist group um, and, uh, and one that we're uh, increasingly focused on. Uh, they broke, as you may know, they broke away from Al-Qaeda recently. Uh, uh, you know, I guess Al-Qaeda was just too nice for them. Or, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and then as far as your question on Iraq, uh, through our Office of Security Cooperation, we continue to provide assistance uh, to the Iraqis uh, and uh, across the instruments of the U.S. government uh, uh, to meet the challenges in Iraq. Um, well, so Iraq is a, is a, you know, the conditions that give rise to the, uh, to the challenge there, you know, have a lot to do with um, political challenges they've had as well as um, uh, a, a significant uh, terrorist threat. Uh, and so there has to be a, a political and economic solution as well as a counterterrorism solution to this problem. And they, they've made some gains in beating back uh, ISIL and Anbar and, and containing its spread elsewhere, but uh, it's a significant challenge to the government. Hello, David Scruggs, Renaissance Strategic Advisors. Question was, you mentioned in the context of cyber working with the industry as a partner, but industry really works across other areas with the intelligence community as well. Given all that's happened in the last three years, how is the departments working with industry gonna change going forward, uh, either in subtle or important ways? Well, I think it's an, uh, an imperative, uh, you know, it, you know, 
be very honest, you know, it's the, the, the current environment and developments hasn't helped uh, uh, that partnership. Um, there's some important legislation uh, moving through the Hill right now to try to set the conditions um, for that that we, we support. And uh, it's just something, you know, as a country, we're going to have to solve because this threat isn't going away. Okay, how about right here? Sir, George Nicholson, CT and uh, Special Operations uh, Consultant for SOCOM. Uh, Kathleen, you alluded to the relationship, I think, between the CIA and DOD. And uh, Mr. Vickers, you probably remember at the OSS dinner, John Brennan got up and said there was not a better relationship in the history that exists today. But how much of that is personality driven because of your background, because of Secretary Gates and Panetta? And a few years ago, the uh, former DNI testified in front of the Senate uh, committee uh, about do we need to relook at Title 10 and Title 50 authorities? Uh, do we need to look at something to codify those relationships better under something like a Title 60? Uh, you know, so the, the fact that uh, a number of us have worked together uh, for a lot of years clearly helps, but I forgot who the uh, French uh, politician who said the grave, you know, graveyards are full of indispensable men. Um, you know, I think it, we've put enough things in place that it will uh, survive the current leadership. It's a very good way to do business and, and the challenges we face uh, uh, dictate it. Um, I don't think we need a, um, you know, we've evolved a lot since 2009 in this uh, beginning of the administration and the Title 10, Title 50, Title 60 um, uh, debate. Um, we, you know, are very, very integrated and go back and forth very easily. And, you know, that part of the system's working really well. Right back here. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an Intel analyst. Are you happy with uh, the level of uh, our dependence on foreign intelligence services? Um, or maybe possibly should we be moving a fraction of our budget to get our own independent capabilities at times? Or in fact, are we going the other way just to save money? Um, well, we have plenty of independent capabilities. Um, uh, and, you know, periodically in some uh, country or crisis, you can find you are too dependent on foreign liaison reporting, um, but I think we've learned from those experiences in the past, and so we, we, we leverage, I mean, we, we depend on an international network of uh, intelligence partners, um, but we have robust uh, unilateral capabilities as well. And, um, uh, you know, one can always adjust the, the system, but globally, I think it, it, it serves us quite well. Okay, how about right here in front? Uh, Steve Winters, Washington-based researcher. Uh, I think uh, many uh, computer uh, experts uh, feel that the, in, a, in, in an attack on a network, the advantages with the attacker and the defenders are really in the weaker position. Uh, it was suggested here at CSIS yesterday by one speaker that in the case of, uh, say, attacks, uh, for instance, for espionage purposes on uh, U.S. networks, uh, that there be some type of response uh, to the attacker besides just trying to beef up the defenses in, given this situation. So if this, these experts are right, uh, what is your advice to the administration, basically, when you have to tell them uh, we can't really stop the attacks because the attacker has the advantage? What, what's the policy? Various suggestions have been made. For instance, uh, a code of conduct between countries about what they're going to allow to do or, you know, proactive counterattacks to attacks to disincentivize attacks. So what, what advice are you giving up the chain on this? Well, I'll keep my uh, advice up the chain private, but let me, let me try to answer your question. Um, so one, I'm not sure I agree with the premise that 
the offense has an enduring advantage in the cyber realm. I mean, it's a very dynamic field, and uh, uh, cybersecurity has evolved. You know, it's a big growth industry, and it's evolved quite a bit. Um, that said, um, you know, there are a lot of what one would describe as soft targets, and so if you're looking to steal something among many things or attack something among many things, uh, that's a hard defensive problem. And it's also, as I mentioned earlier, in response to, uh, you know, cyber policy it, it, or, you know, an economic uh, strategy, it's not, you know, it's not sound economics to have to invest so much in, in, in defenses. Um, and then, in so then, in terms of the appropriate response, even if offense gets harder, it still still will be feasible, and there still will be softer, relatively softer targets to harder targets. And so, the instruments you can deploy against that policy is one. Code of conduct is this really in people's interest to carry out this kind of uh, uh, conflict. Um, you know, again, this is a new and evolving domain, and so some of the policy discussions are in their early stages, as well as potentially other methods, law enforcement, uh, uh, blocking an attack, you know, to, to tailored to the circumstances. So I think in cyber, as in anything else, uh, you need to deploy the full range of instruments, uh, uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving field. Okay, last question right up front. Jennifer Chen uh, with Change Media Group. My question is, what's your solution about the cybersecurity issues between U.S. and China, and what's your response about the new Chinese report released on May 26, accusing U.S. of hacking of China, and the hacking activities involve companies like Microsoft and Google? Thank you so much. Can you repeat the, the last part on Google and Microsoft? Uh, yeah, there is a new report from China accusing U.S. of hacking of China. The hacking activities involve companies like Microsoft and Google. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of a report uh, about uh, Microsoft and um, uh, and, and, and Google. Um, um, back to the question about cyber norms and cyber policy, uh, we have a cyber working group to work with the uh, Chinese on uh, establishing a cyber code of conduct and others that, uh, uh, you know, is an important initiative and we certainly hope it will uh, continue. Okay, Secretary Vickers, you've been extremely generous with your time this morning. We put you through the ringer. Um, and I appreciate uh, you um, being as forthcoming as you are able to be. Obviously, you have a position that is particularly difficult um, in terms of, in terms of uh, providing us unclassified information, and we appreciate your willingness to come down here today and talk to us. So please join me, with the audience, please join me in thanking you.